All right, so today we're going to start our conversation about um, yet another portion of the uh, water cycle, and that is uh, the presence of ice on the planet. As you're probably aware, thanks to nothing else if not the uh, series of movies, uh, we've had things on this planet called ice ages, and they have come and gone over the years. Um, you are probably also aware that um, a lot of people are concerned that what we have left for ice on this planet is, is melting away. Anywhere from concerns about uh, sea level rising to uh, people no longer having a source of fresh water in the spring and summer uh, from snow melt that would come down from mountains. Uh, it really crosses the uh, gamut of, of worrying. And um, I haven't really focused too much in this class on, um, well, I, I guess I have worked in the human element a good bit, but uh, traditionally, again, depending on who teaches it, they focus a lot on the effects of, of population and more so the distribution of population on this planet. And as you, again, aware just from being on this planet for the last 20 some odd years of your life, um, people aren't always where the resources are, uh, for better or for worse. Well, never for better, but, um, and that creates hardships on them. And, um, <coughs> you know, some of that we have some, some, uh, can have some effect on. Some of it is, is seemingly beyond our, uh, our means to control at the moment, or at least affect uh, effectively. Um, but uh, this water situation, it's really important. It's, it's one of the, the primary uh, needs for, for life. Um, so controlling what we can about it is, is kind of important and definitely within the scope of this class. Now, going back to the ice, ice ages for a moment, um, again, you, you hear a lot about it nowadays, and you hear a lot about carbon dioxide and um, its effects on this whole system. And while I am in no way trying to diminish that, um, you are, again, well aware that at least once, I, I won't tell you that it's done it dozens of times, but at least once, um, we've gone into and out of ice ages, uh, raised and lowered sea levels with absolutely no human interference. Okay? Um, in other words, Mother Nature has her cycles. It, it's, I'd love to think, and it's easy to think, um, that we can't affect them. Okay? Um, but she does things, you know, well above our pay grade, as a lot of people like to say, oh, that's above my pay grade, I, I, I have no effect on that, I can't worry about that. She's up there, she's at the top, okay, and does whatever the hell she wants. We see that with earthquakes, we see that with hurricanes, we see that all, all the time. Um, again, I'm not saying that we shouldn't worry about the CO2. What we are doing is uh, potentially making a problem, a natural cycle, we're exaggerating it. We're making it worse. Okay, and that we do have some control over. But more than likely, at some point, uh, the glaciers would have started melting with or without us monkeying around. So, um, it has happened time after time after time again. It's a natural rebounding cycle. You guys in here already have heard you know, about the nitrogen cycle, the phosphate cycle, all these different cycles. Well, the, the, the carbon dioxide cycle is, is also something else that, that is naturally going on. And um, when it lowers globally, um, things tend to cool off. And the water cycle shifts towards making more snow and ice. When the um, CO2 levels rise up, we tend to see the water and the ice uh, melt because global temperatures go up, 
and that throws in different things into effect, and they, they feed each other. They're the feedback loops. Okay, I, I don't I don't want to say I don't know enough about it to, to explain it much more than that, but kind of, sort of. Um, I do know that they feed off of one another, and when we bounce down really low in one, that rebounds us back up in the other direction. It's cyclic. Okay? So, as you'll see towards the end of this conversation, um, we left the last S, uh, ice age about 10,000 years ago. Geologically speaking, that's not horribly long at all. In our lifetimes, the stuff you guys are used to, yeah, that's it's forever ago, right? But it's, it's really not that long. To go back to some things you, you might... Um, you know, that are in your time frame, go all the way back to the Egyptians and building the temples, uh, I'm sorry, the pyramids and whatnot. Okay, you're about halfway there. So there were probably still bits and pieces of glaciers around when they were doing their thing. I just read an article, and I don't know how reliable it was at all, um, that was talking about the fact that, uh, I don't know if it was mastodons or woolly mammoths, but one of the two were uh, still around while the Egyptians were building the pyramids. And I think I've seen at least one movie uh, show them attempting to harness the, the mastodons. Um, thinking about that, though, you know, the likelihood of a giant, hairy elephant being in Egypt, at least what we've learned about niches and environments, yeah, it, it was not exactly there by choice at any rate. Now, could one of those crazy Roman emperors have gone and found some and then traded them? Yeah, okay, maybe. You can weave stories all you want, you know, to make whatever you want to happen. And plus, it's Hollywood. But um, but we're, we're that, that time frame wasn't too far removed from back then. That was a long time ago, though. All right? But that is recent in the Earth's cycles. So it's easy to argue that we are still leaving even though it's 10,000 years ago, that we're still exiting that last ice age, all right? And the tendency is then towards warming. So we could expect melting to continue. But then if you look at other data, you know, scientists, they love to look at data, you can find evidence that there are, again, we've got dozens of ice ages in the records, in the rock records, in the ice core records, and various records, evidence that there were many gaps in Ice Age periods. Uh, at the moment, I forget what they're called, uh, but there's a word for them either. They happen that frequently that they made a vocabulary word for them, where there's warming bits while you're still in an Ice Age. All right. And those periods are actually longer than we've been out of, in quotes, the last ice age. So there's people that are arguing that we're still in an ice age. We're just in one of those, we'll call it a regression. That's not the word for it. But we're in a, in a regression period for the moment. Yeah. What about the movie Ice Age? What about it? Does that have anything to do with this? Well, other than it occurred during one, um, they're playing pretty loose and liberal with the critters involved. Uh, in all honesty, I've seen um, maybe one of them. I like that silly little squirrel in his acorn. Um, that's in the beginning of all those. I've watched those several times. But, uh, yeah, I've, I've not really seen them, except that I know that towards the end they brought in a dinosaur or two, and they should have been long dead by then. But, uh, but at any rate, um, it, it gives you a good idea for what's... Now, people were in the picture. There were definitely people around. Um, you know, Homo sapien, our, our species, is about 2 million years old. Um, Homo sapiens sapien, our... our Subgenre, if you are subspecies, if you would, um, truly modern humans uh, came out right around the post ice age. The uh, the retreating of the glaciers allowed us to step yet another bit forward. Um, so we were definitely around that part. Of ice age is correct. There was a, definitely you know, little humans around, um, but uh, but yeah, you know, for around here, what you guys would want to picture is, um, will be that the glaciers have retreated. This area was covered by a mile-high wall of ice that, that reached all the way back to, uh, up to the, the North Pole, so to speak. Um, but let's say you're in front of that now, 
So you would be in a, a giant sort of outwash plane, which you'll see in a couple minutes, we'll actually get to that part of the conversation. Um, and as you got closer and closer to the, to the wall of ice, of course, the temperature would get colder and colder, but that's a huge source of water. So there would be all kinds of animals there. And uh, again, we're going back 10,000 years. So you had your, your saber tooths, you had your woolies and you had all that stuff still running around along with us. So from, from that aspect, yeah, the movies aren't too far off, but they are cartoons by the same company who brought us the <coughs> yellow single-eyed critters, if I'm not mistaken. So we don't want to give them too much scientific credit. All right, so more than likely you guys tuned out about five minutes ago and you've been staring at the picture hopefully in front of me. And what I want to draw your attention to is hopefully something you've noticed and it's that white river looking thing uh, in the middle, it looks maybe like some white wax or somebody spilled some milk. That's a glacier, all right? And um, while certainly that doesn't look like a mile high wall of ice, you're not in front of it looking up at it. You're flying over it in an airplane looking down. Nowadays, what we have ice sheets aside, going up way north or way south, where you have Antarctica completely covered in ice. You know the North Pole, there's no land, right? That's just ice up there. Um, you go north of, uh, of, uh, of the Asia and Europe, you've got no land. You go north of North America, you've got no land, okay? Um, that's all ice up there. So that melts, you know, it's different than when they talk about melting down on Antarctica. We won't get into that right now, but um, so this here is what we call alpine. This is the mountains. This is what people talk about, uh, glaciers are melting. This is pretty much what we got left, is the stuff that's in the mountains. So they're not going to be these ginormous, mile-high, thousands of mile long kind of thing, but they still have a lot of power behind them. It is a river of ice. It's what it looks like. It's a good name to call it. Okay, even this though could be upwards of a mile deep. It's hard to tell from this angle, but it's a great picture of one. And there's another one sort of in the background there, snaking along. It looks like there might be a little one joining that one. And like I said, we'll talk all about that as we go through. But that is a modern day glacier. There's another view of the same sort of idea. We see it snaking along through this. It's really hard to get perspective, though, scale, if you would. Suffice it to say that's a probably a pretty high uh, mountain there coming off to the left. We see some little cracks in the foreground here towards the bottom. Uh, those are called crevasses. We'll talk about those. They actually... Uh, are good indicators of something. But you see it just snaking around into it just, just like a river. Yes. So we mentioned this before. Um, now we're giving it a little context that you could go pretty much anywhere on the planet if you go high enough and find snow year round. You could go to Hawaii or any other tropical island and if there's a high enough mountain on it, you'll find snow. So we know the idea between elevation, we got that connection, okay? So we're just now reinforcing the idea how that changes with latitude. As you go north or south from the equator, you have to go less and less high uh, to find it until eventually when you're at the poles and it is at ground level. And again, this is permanent snow, all right? Permanent snow, which is what we need to build up to these, these glaciers. And every so often I do go into the fancy pronouncing of glaciers and call them glaciers. You have to forgive glaciers? me. It's like the folks that say they go to Target instead of Targets. I feel um, like that. But uh, yeah, glaciers. So, like I said, we need uh, uh, snow to build up. Um, I grew up in the Midwest. I grew up in Ohio, which isn't exactly tropical, not even subtropical. But it sure as heck 
isn't as long a winter as we got here. Now, mind you, I left there 25-some years ago, but I still had some geological knowledge then. Um, you guys here, I, I, I joke about driveway glaciers and roof glaciers. This winter, not a good example, but think back through your childhood to these giant, giant things of ice that form on your roofs or at the ends of your driveway. Hell, I damn near carved a, 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 ripped a hole in the side of the minivan one year when I first moved here, pulling out. That stuff is rock hard down at the bottom, okay? And that is a great uh, allegory. That's not the right word, probably. Metaphor, something, example. Yeah, we'll just keep it simple. Great example of how glacial ice forms out of snow, all right? You get that little bit of melting and then refreezing and then the melting and then the refreezing and the compaction as the plows come by and you come by with your shovels or the little kids climbing around on the piles. The roof, it's all just melted in compaction. Damn near killed myself first year poking at it with a shovel. Luckily, 20 years ago, I had slightly more cat-like reflexes and I was able to jump back as this I could barely lift it up. I got a picture of me posing with it somewhere. It was a huge hunk of ice. And I see why, you know, people want to get them off their roofs. But uh, it's it's a great example, okay? Now, there's some, some vocabulary in here. We're not going to really worry too much about granular snow and fern as, as steps along the way. But this, this melting and compacting and then refreezing is essentially what's going on. Time scale over on the side is kind of interesting. Again, if you didn't ponder that it could actually last that long, okay, it can. Um, especially in these areas, you know, again, where we're in the northern more or southern more latitudes, higher latitudes, as they say, um, where the snow sticks around a whole lot longer. Obviously, the stuff on the bottom is older than the stuff on the top. Should go without saying, but we'll say it anyhow. I don't know. It's a great question. I have no idea. I can tell you that it is melting back enough that they've actually started some coalitions and whatnot because, guess what, money. It's always money. Um, there you can pretty much start shipping through there again. It's melting back that much. And that's a huge shortcut for a lot of companies. Um, so not exactly where they in favor of global warming, and I'm not going to... Uh, warming, um, and I'm not going to go make a conspiracy theory that, you know, they, they caused it so they can save on shipping money. That'd be silly to do that. But, yeah, it would be overkill, exactly. But they sure as hell are taking advantage of the idea. So, um, it is probably very old, but, but a date I don't have, but it, it really is melting. It really is melting away. Um, so. So there's uh, air, oh yeah, air trapped, air trapped in it, and and they could kind of not that you could date air exactly, but there's pollen in the air, there's dust in the air, there is stuff that you can grab out of there, oh. and that's how we know when that's you know they tell you we got an ice core and it goes back this many years. They're they're in, and this is also how we know CO two levels have changed or whatever because they're they're literally sampling the air. It's like putting it in a Ziploc baggie and and. and keeping it for thousands of years. Um, so yeah, they it's accurate data. You know, they 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 really are snapshots. And here's just yet another example. Um, if you're still somehow not picturing what we're talking about, imagine when you're playing a snowball fight and you kind of overpack, over melt that snow in your hand and you you beam someone with that, that really icy ball instead of the snowball. Yeah, same idea. Okay, same idea. You will see the word fern uh, a, a few times. It's that just sort of pre-glacier ice stuff. Um, but that word does show up over and over again. It's like little ice balls, um, pellets. <clears throat> permafrost. Uh, permafrost means almost exactly what it means. We're used to thinking of frost as that stuff on the inside of our freezer or maybe on our car windows. It's not exactly what they mean here. Uh, what they're talking about is frozen soil. 
All right. Um, again, not a great year to use this as an example, but uh, if you had a uh, pet goldfish or a hamster or something when you were little, and they perhaps may have uh, expired over the winter time, um, you, you, your parents might have told you that I'm, you know, I'm sorry, we can't go, you know, very fluffy. Um, you know, the ground is frozen. All right. And even to the extent of maybe in some years right now, even though there's no snow, the, the, the moisture, the groundwater, whatever you want to call it, in the soil makes it really, really hard to dig in and it takes some time to get through it. So that's, that's permafrost. It's that frozen soil. And so what we're seeing here then is, is sort of a, a map, if you would, um, of where, um, we have this various levels of permafrost. Discontinuous, you could essentially call that seasonal, okay? Um, and uh, we don't get permafrost per se. Again, I was using our frozen soil as an example, but um, you see we're well below that. But uh, again, this is all year round, okay? Um, so I, I shouldn't have actually said discontinuous equals seasonal. Discontinuous is a better word for saying it's sort of spotty, all right? Um, there are bits and pieces that are thing because seasonal obviously goes all the way down to, to where we live. Um, I misspoke. Uh, so you see the Great Lakes there, wonderful rendition. Um, you live uh, somewhere between the uh, last two on the right there. Okay, that's Lake Erie. Uh, I don't know if I can get my mouse to work. Usually I can't get it to show up on the screen. So that's Lake Erie. That's Lake Ontario. All right. Um, and uh, so, yeah, you're over that a ways. Um, below that, you'll see the dashed line. And that is um, the, the southern limit of permafrost during the last ice age. The glaciers really didn't go much further than uh, Pennsylvania, Ohio. Uh, what comes next over there? Illinois. Okay. Um, and then it kind of came up um, uh, through uh, Wisconsin and whatnot. Uh, so the permafrost was in front of the glaciers a good bit. But um, but definitely the meltback. And again, when people ask you, you know, how long ago did the glaciers uh, leave, obviously the further south you're talking about, the earlier the, uh, they left, so the longer ago they left. So if you were down uh, in, say, southern Ohio and the Kentucky even a little bit, you would say the glaciers took back maybe 12,000 years ago. We're in northern New York. We say about 10,000 years. Okay. Um, but again, it varies. It varies. Alpine permafrost is still there. That's the, uh, what mountain chain are we looking at over there more than likely? What mountain chains in the western U.S.? Oh, goodness, people. We're looking probably at the Rockies, okay? Um, you don't see anything over here for the Appalachians. Um, the Adirondacks are a portion of the Appalachians. Um, they just don't get high enough for that. Um, the Rockies, a uh, good, bit, good bit higher. All right, uh, a whole bunch of stuff we really don't need to worry about, but it, it gives you an idea of, of what's going on underneath that ice. You saw several aerial pictures, okay? And uh, that was of the very top of this river. you got to wonder, if it's a river, it must mean it's flowing. How does it flow? Well, that's what we're trying to explain here. you got a couple things going on. You've got the fact that the earth itself is warm. Okay? It is? Yes. The, 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 the ground is warm. All right? And so that keeps a sort of fluid lubricant la layer, if you would, um, between the glacier itself and the, the earth. Um, it keeps that a little slippy. Uh, that being said, it's not like an ice cube sliding down a slope, though. All right. Uh, again, this is a long river sort of thing. And what they're trying to show you, if you look at the far side of the diagram, um, that drill hole, you see a drill hole, and then you see a really bent-looking one uh, a little towards the front of the image there. This is like time one and time two. And what they're trying to show you is that there's sort of an overturn, tumbling 
within the ice itself, within the glacier itself. So it doesn't really move evenly. Um, and again, while the bottom is slipping, what we're trying to measure here is the, uh, the turning over uh, within the, uh, the glacier itself. Uh, they use the word plastic a lot of times when you read this chapter, you're talking about plastic flow. Um, plastic flow is, is really kind of probably what you're thinking. It, it's bendable, it's, it's bendy. Um, and uh, the idea like if you took a plastic spoon or a spork or something like that and put a little pressure on it, it would bend, but then it would go back to normal. Uh, if you press it too far, of course, it will you know, snap. We don't want to go that far. But the idea of this, this plastic bendable motion there. Um, the basal slip word on there, that's basal usually means bottom. Thermometers they use for little kids are called basal thermometers. They go, you know, not in the mouth. Um, but up towards the surface, the further you get away from that warmness of the earth, the ice gets more and more like, like we know ice. All right, and they have this brittle zone there. And the brittle zone is up towards the top, and the, and the higher you go, the more brittle the ice gets. And that's why, remember I used the word crevasses earlier, you see it on there now. Those are those cracks in the ice. And you see those as indicators of, of flow. All right, the crevasses form as perhaps that ice is going around a corner, and so on and so forth. And again, from an airplane, they're wonderful. They're great to give you some idea of what's going on. You see a lot of crevasses. Maybe it's moving a lot. Um, you see a couple. Maybe it's not going that far or whatever. Um, but it, they can actually be quite quite horrible and dangerous uh, when you get out of that helicopter and you get down and you start hiking. All right? And we've all seen you know these movies of people that are camping in weather, horrible weather up there and, and doing this, that, and the other, whether they're climbing mountains or whatever. But... The problem is, is you can get a foot, two, three, four feet of snow overnight like like nothing. Um, so you're out the next morning and you're you're hiking up the glacier, down the glacier, whatever your your goal is that day. Those crevasses can be completely covered. All right, um, and if you fall into one of those things, not good, not good. Um, never, not that. You guys are likely to go hiking on a glacier, but I have to say, just as a PSA sort of thing, um, never go hiking on a glacier alone. Um, always have somebody there. And again, they end up tying themselves together. So if somebody falls in there, and God forbid the other person's following them right in. Usually in the movies, they manage to save themselves. Though right after two or three go over the edge, somebody clicks in with their with their cleats. And, uh, or their ice pick or something and stops everyone from then miraculously has the upper body strength, right? So, anywho, um, evil things. And anyway, crevasses have killed more people than, I don't know what, definitely more than get gotten run over by a glacier. Um, but, uh, anywho, yeah, no, that'd be really hard to get run over by a glacier. More of this, we don't need to see more of this. Okay, so now we've got um, something really great for tests, and that's labeling diagrams, right? Uh, my diagram looks a whole lot more like a slug. I think you'll see one in a couple slides. But for right now, we'll learn on very pretty um, art. So, uh, again, the scale is completely missing from this. We're going up a mountainside, though, okay? So up at the top, we've got something called zone of accumulation. And, and, and guess what's happening there? Snow is accumulating, exactly. All right, snow is building up. Um, more than likely, this is 24-7, 365 kind of thing, okay? At least the 365 part. Uh, all year long, you're up high enough, and this glacier is constantly getting fed. When that stops, well, then we're just going to be dealing with you know, the glacier melting back, and we'll get to that at the, at the bottom. So this is a this is an ongoing cycle here. We want to keep feeding that. So zone of accumulation. Um, we're going to uh, skip snow line for a moment and go down to zone of ablation. And I don't want you to use the word ablation um, for whatever reason. Ablation is a, a really weird word anyhow. We're going to just call it zone of wastage because the books I used years ago, uh, they always called it that, and I kind of got it into my head. 
and uh, zone of wastage makes a little more sense than zone of ablation because it's wasting away, all right, in the zone of wastage. So this is down, you're much more seasonal, you're way down the hill now, and the zone of ablation, um, you're not getting constantly fed. Again, you might get some winter snows, but this is sort of the down at the end of the glacier. What separates those two, now we'll go back up briefly, is that snow line, or sometimes called the fern line. That's that F-I-R-N. We saw that word a handful of times. And that is the line between the permanent snow and the seasonal snow, okay? So the snow line or the fern line, and please put both of those words in your notes, um, is a very important thing, uh, and that moves, okay, depending on, on what's going on with the glacier. All right, there's a whole lot of words. We're going to skip over them momentarily, and we're going to jump all the way down to terminus or toe, okay? Terminus is... It's like terminal, it's the end. Um, so that is the end or the, the front bottom, if you would, of said glacier. So we have the zone of accumulation, the zone of ablation, I'm sorry, zone of wastage, did it to myself, uh, snow line, and now the terminus, okay? The terminus. That's your glacial anatomy, if you would. All these other words are anecdotal. So, sublimation. You hopefully remember that from the water cycle conversation. Sublimation is that uh, phase matter, phase change of going straight from uh, solid to gas. Okay? So, we're just, they're just showing you uh, a, a number of ways you see melting, obviously, on there as well. A number of ways that uh, this is wasting away down at the bottom. Again, scale is really hard to tell. It can be significantly warmer down there. Um, not really, I wasn't on a glacier, but um, your senior year as a geologist, you go out uh, west, especially when you're in Ohio like I was, you go out west so you can actually see some geology. And uh, I'll never forget, I don't know the exact date, but I know it was July, and um, we left camp and it had been miserable hot all day and so on and so forth. We went up to our site and there was snow on the ground, okay? And that was a 20 minute drive in a van. So certainly coming down the side of a, of a, of a mountain that is, has a glacier on it, um, you can experience enough temperature changes where you would easily experience this. So um, again, scale is tough here. So a lot of meltwater this, meltwater that. The stuff I want you to know about that we'll talk about later. Uh, the word calving on there is the process of uh, ice breaking off and icebergs forming. Calving as in birthing a cow. Uh, I guess somebody saw some uh, relation there. Back when we first started the semester and we talked about science and scientific method, I mentioned that a lot of the uh, early science came from either the very rich or the very poor. All right, you're, old, you're, you're, you're wealthy enough to be able to uh, afford to go to school, not work, be able to sit on your balcony, look out and ponder things. Or you're stuck in a field all day, keeping an eye on your sheep and staring at the mountains around you. Both of them contributed equally, in my opinion. So those early observationalists, as I like to call them, um, watching this whether it was the noise of the ice breaking off, reminded them of a cow being born, I don't know, or just the little white chunks floating around in the meltwater in front of it, they call it calving. So again, zone of accumulation, snow or fern line, zone of wastage, and terminus. Slightly less confusing picture here. Zone of accumulation up top, still have the word snow line there. They're still using ablation. Uh, we've got terminus, all right, and then the melt in front of it. As I said, my diagram is even simpler and rather slug-like. 
So using everything we've just been talking about, what would you call D? Zone of accumulation. Zone of accumulation. Awesome. C? Snow line or fern line. Please remember I use them interchangeably. I don't want you to get confused on the test. B? Wastage, and then lastly, A. They say you can hold three to four things in short-term memory. We've just hit three of them, so we're at, at the limit for most folks. Yeah, terminus, all right? Guarantee you that is four questions on the next test. For us, it's Tuesday the 30th. Last day of school is technically Wednesday, but not for us. Wait, you said Tuesday is what day? It's the 30th, yeah. Because Monday, the, Wednesday the 1st is the last day of the semester. And then Thursday, Friday are snow, uh, study days. Finals kick in that Monday of the following week. Tuesday, Wednesday, and then Friday is graduation. So what's the missing item that the doctor that really depends on the teacher. I can't answer for my colleagues, unfortunately. Uh, I can tell you that I tend not to have the test made ahead of time, just because the semester varies, but somebody could be using the same test for the last 30 years. You know? So yeah, definitely talk to them. Communication, communication, communication. Um, for us, it's going to be online, you know that, just like all the others. Uh, test four is not a final, it's just test four. So um, more than likely, it'll be on Monday night. I tried to do that at least throughout the semester. I usually turn it on around five or six, if not eight or nine. Um, but it is scheduled for that last Tuesday, the 30th. Okay. All right, so again, my less fancy diagrams. You'll see one more a little later. So back to crevasses, we already talked about them uh, here again as a remembrance of what it is. Um, not that it's not fairly obvious when you're flying over to an airplane which way the glacier's going, but these can certainly uh, give you an idea of, of flow direction, all right? And again, scale is, is crazy here. Um, those, you know, little rocks there that you think might be something you'd be climbing on at a beach or something like that can be, you know, 100 feet high, and once that snow melts, they could be 1,000 feet. Really hard to gauge scale. Other than that's a hiker, but even there, you see little footprints leading up to it. All right, um, weathering and erosion, not such an issue in uh, this class. If we were in geology, I'd focus a lot more on this we talk about the agents of weathering and erosion, um, and ice is one of the biggies, wind, water, ice, and gravity. Um, but uh, in here, you know, glaciers, it's, it's sort of a joke, it's sort of a pun, it's whatever. Glaciers, the, it's the original snowplow, okay? Nothing can stop a, a mile-high wall of ice thousand miles long. It's, it's going to plow through whatever it wants to. You guys growing up here, you know that it carved... Um, the Finger Lakes out of streams, okay? Those things were streams before they were lakes. That's kind of why they're long, like fingers. Um, they carve valleys out. Okay, now they do tend to go where there's already a, a low spot or a weakness, just like everything else. They, you know, follow the path of least resistance, but they will gouge out like it's butter. Okay, it's just, it's just an immense force. And as it's doing that, it picks up all a lot of the rubble that it's gouging out and carries it along with it. So you get down into where we are, when these things melt it out, all of that rubble comes out. So that's the erosion part. Remember, erosion is transportation, weathering is breaking down. I don't know if you guys remember your science class or not, but um, so that transportation is erosion, and then it gets deposited down here. Is that, and then you end up with these. You know, if you're driving around again up north and you see these, these giant rock walls and these houses built of, of the rocks and everything. So the farmers were pulling those out of their fields so they could farm them. All right, it was just rubble everywhere. And um, you may as well do something good with all the, all the stones, right? 
But um, down here, you're in a river valley. You've got to keep that in mind, too. Um, so we've got two things working for us. Streams love to transport uh, sediment as well. Uh, I, When we first got here, our house was um, right by Sequoia Creek. And uh, we wanted to put a fence up. We had kids. We didn't want to run around crazy. And I just wanted a fence. South Utica, you get that postage stamp of a lawn to begin with. So I wanted to claim out my space. And uh, I started digging holes by hand. And I was filling up, you know, five-gallon bucketfuls of, of rocks for every post. It was insane how much rock. But we were 100 yards off a stream bed. So also to be expected. The stuff that you notice around here are those giant boulders, all right? Especially when those giant boulders are granite or some metamorphic rock that we just don't have around here. And the geologists will tell you that that has got carried down from Canada. A lot of igneous rock and whatnot up in Canada. <coughs> and it was all they can do when they were digging the foundations for these buildings or whatever. Usually you'll see one out in front of like a business park or something like that. Sometimes they pay good money for them. Usually it was all they could do to get that thing up and out of the basement for the foundation and, and right on the front lawn that says, look good there? Good. All right, it's staying. Because those things are massive. Um, those are called erratics. They have a name too. But uh, you'll see it a little later. But so um, definitely down here, we're, we're not so much in an erosional, I'm sorry, a weathering area for glaciers. We're in a depositional one. Uh, if you guys have spent a lot of time driving south of, out of Syracuse, towards uh, Binghamton, down 81 there. A lot of rolling hills off to either side. You'll see these again in a couple minutes. Um, those are drumlins. Those are deposits of sediment that were left by the glaciers. So we're in, we're in that kind of environment there. Uh, nothing necessarily that was gouged out by the glaciers per se, but was deposited. We were gouged out, but it dropped all kind of crap on top of it. So that's, that's what we see. All right, this next slide has nine vocab, a lot of vocabulary words. Glaciers is tough. I, I won't kid you. There's a lot of vocabulary words. So what we're looking at now is, I don't know, half a dozen plus glaciers here, okay? And we're going to be taking them away in a moment and looking at the terrain that's left after the glaciers have um, gone away basically the valleys. And the first thing we want to point out is that glaciers tend to leave U-shaped valleys. You see how those ones up front there, they're kind of cross-section, and you definitely got a, a semicircle. The difference, bless you, the difference is that rivers carve V-shaped valleys. I never found this particularly useful from uh, pers our perspective of you know standing and looking out at something, because usually they get so filled up with sediment that they all look U-shaped to me at any rate. But um, arguably a river carves a V-shaped valley, glaciers carve a U-shaped valley, and as a trained earth science -y sort of person, you should be able to say, oh, that, there's a river valley, and that, there's a glacier valley. Because they can both have rivers in them, again, by the end, because it's a low spot. That's what happens to low spots, they fill up with water. But uh, Anywho, so the U-shaped valley is the first thing we want to notice. Okay, we removed all the glaciers. And, oh good, the first vocabulary word is U-shaped valley. And then we've got cirque, arete, horn, or arete. I'm not sure, I don't do French. Uh, cirque, arete, horn, hanging valley, and truncated spur. That's cool. Hmm? Yeah, that's cool. Hmm. So let's do Cirque first. So we got a picture of a Cirque. Let's go to the picture of a Cirque real quick. See that sort of amphitheater looking depression that's there? What I'm going to call this is, is multi-hyphenated here. It is a steep-backed, bowl-shaped depression. Put as many hyphens as you want in that, or none. Steep-backed, bowl-shaped depression and this is at the very top of the mountain. This is where the glacier starts. And remember how we told you that um, there's a lot of overturn? Okay, this is where the glacier's digging in its heels and pushing off from. And as a result, it just grinds up all of this extra 
<coughs> rock and sends it downhill. And this is often, as we said, sort of the deepest, steepest part of the uh, of this valley that we're building. Um, even though it's you know uphill. So that's a cirque, and again, you're going to see it in the cartoon here. Um, so in any one of these, let's let's switch over to the word horn now for a minute. The horn is sort of the the hub in the center here. It's the raised part, and you've got all of these glacial valleys, all of these cirques sort of going around that, that hub. What that leaves is an exceptionally uh, pointy sort of mountain top there um, because it's, uh, you can almost imagine it like the top of a Phillips screwdriver, okay? Um, so that's what a horn is. It's going to be a, a um, exceptionally pointy <laughs> top of a mountain that's carved out by glaciers. We're going to talk about a famous one in a moment and probably ruin it for you. Um, so, uh, so that's a horn. Uh, next, we see the word arete. And that is that narrow ridge between two glacial valleys. Uh, we've got a, a much better picture of an arete coming up here. Um, but it's a very steep ridge um, that is just, as I said, between two, two of these U-shaped valleys. So it's downhill from the cirque. It's a divider. Now you might be thinking, why why did the glacier make you know all these separate little valleys? Just dumb luck. Okay, this is for educational purposes, diagram kind of thing, but it's is based on reality. I think they might have a, a good amount of glaciers in this one, but nonetheless. Um, but you do get these dividers between the different glacial valleys, and they can be very uh, a ret. Um, I was told means knife. I, I don't know. A ret right, means edge. knife. Yeah, it sounds like more like a stop, a stop in some language, um, or cease. But uh, I was told it's supposed to be like a knife edge. That's what it's referring to. Uh, hanging Valley. Uh, they've got it all the way over on the right side of the diagram, but I personally think the left side of the diagram, where we got that big old U-shaped valley there, shows a lot more hanging valleys than the other one is. Uh, basically, it's whenever one glacier cuts off another glacial valley, and you get these beautiful waterfalls. Because, uh, again, it's draining, come all the way along down there, and then whoosh, this thing cuts right through it. And um, and that's a truncated spur is basically just the end of an arete that's been shaved off as well. Truncated spur doesn't show up on the test, but all these other ones do. <clears throat> so it, they're just a mess. They're riddled you know, with just all these valleys and, and glaciers, again, pay no mind to anything. They go where they want to. Yes. So they quite often cut them, cut themselves off and, and plow through old things. So we already saw the picture of the Cirque. Um, Hanging Valley, again, there's a glacier came through and just uh, where there was a nice little valley already and a river flowing through it. They sliced it right off, doesn't care. But again, makes a pretty little waterfall. Oh, so there's the horn. And uh, remember we talked about these poor shepherds stuck out there in the wood, in the, in the fields watching their sheep. Um, so what's the most famous horn out there? You guys know it. You didn't know it was this probably. Yeah, the Matterhorn, the Matterhorn. We call it Matterhorn because we're in America. But it's the Matterhorn. The Matterhorn is mother. The mother's horn. What do you think it's? They think they're looking at? Yeah, boobies. You can say it. Okay. Or titties? Well, I wouldn't say that. No. But uh, some people, yeah. Bless you. So yeah, so that's what the Matterhorn is. It's a boob. Um, again, lonely shepherd. But uh, so the horn, again, we've got a, a, a cirques and valleys carving unusually pointy out there. And um, that's what leaves the uh, unnaturally high uh, point there. All right. Uh, again, we have our intrepid hiker. And uh, we're looking at that, that ridge that's going into uh, the background there through the center of the photo, more or less. And I would not want to hike that. I'm not a very intrepid hiker in the first place, but certainly walking along a snowy, icy, 
narrow ridge, which either side of it leads down to a uh, <laughs> yeah, an unfortunate ending. Um, but you know, there's there's folks out there doing this. Um, so that's that's an arret, uh, obviously snow covered, but. All right, so those were, as I said, um, weathering features, okay? That's the snow, the ice gouging out. Um, now, I told you that down here where we are, you know, all that happened, but we're down where the melt is, so we are mainly a, uh, a, a terrain that is uh, shaped by a deposition, deposits of all that stuff that got gouged out up, up north. Uh, that's what a moraine is. A moraine is a glacial deposit, <clears throat> Generally speaking, it's it is a uh, a ridge, okay, and um, just like when you let any scientist uh, study one thing in particular for all their life, uh, they've got you know twelve different flavors of moraines. Uh, we're gonna learn a handful of them, and again, yes, there's a diagram on said test, um, but it'll be my lovely little slug diagrams not uh, something this fancy, but we'll start with the fancy one. So again, a moraine is a uh, elongated pile uh, of sediment, a ridge, if you want to call it that, that, that melted out of the glacier. So we're going to start with, uh, on the left-hand side here, we're just going to start with a lateral moraine. A lateral moraine is a moraine that forms on the along the side of a glacier. Let's just imagine for a moment that there's only one glacier on this diagram, there would be a lateral moraine on either side of it where it kind of melts out and it just leaves a ridge of, of, of sediment, okay? They've complicated things so we could learn more vocabulary words and now they have one, two, three, four glaciers on the one side and two glaciers on the other side coming together and what they're telling you now is that if um, you've got a lateral moraine in the middle or thereabouts. Uh, we no longer call that a lateral moraine. We call it a medial moraine. Think about the median when you're driving down the road, that center divider thingy. All right. So when you've got a moraine uh, running in between two glaciers, they call it a medial moraine. Doesn't matter if there's three or four like on the one side or just one on the other. Thank goodness they don't differentiate that, okay? So those more or less run parallel to the glacier, if you would. Because down at the end of the glacier, remember our word terminus, okay, we've got more moraines. We've got moraines that um, melt out of the front, and these tend to be uh, perpendicular, if you would, or, or horizontal to the, to the glacier. And uh, the first word we're going to use is end moraine. An end moraine is that pile of moraine that builds up at the end of the glacier, the terminus, to use, again, the proper vocabulary word. However, once you get more than one end moraine, just like with laterals, the terminology changes. So, first and foremost, any moraine behind the last moraine you follow? Any moraine behind the last moraine is going to be called a recessional moraine. And in this case, they have three. So imagine at time one, uh, those two right in front of the glacier weren't there. It was just the last one, right? The glacier was there. It melted away. It left a pile. Well, it melted away so much that it moved uphill and left another pile. It has to sit there for a little while. Then... We moved uphill even further, and we deposited another moraine. So while it was an end moraine when there was just one of them there, now that there's more, we call them recessional moraines. Additionally, that last moraine, the furthest one out, now becomes the terminal moraine. So the last end moraine is now the terminal moraine. So if there's only one, it's an end moraine. If there's more than one, the end moraine gets called a terminal moraine, and anything behind the terminal moraine is a recessional moraine. You following that? What does lateral mean? <coughs> Sorry? What does lateral mean? Lateral means, uh, oh, you were out of the room for that one. 
we don't get to tell you because you left. It means along with silence. So we fall on this recessional, terminal, and because we got one more, we got ground. Ground is just when it doesn't stay long enough to build up a hill. It's just like a sheet. All right, so that's a steady retreat. You tend to see a hill, then a sheet, then a hill, then a sheet, then a hill, then a sheet, but it, again, it varies. <coughs> this is one of those things where they're just doing it for educational purposes. <coughs> and the biggest thing of it all is next year, just for example, in this diagram, uh, the weather could turn cold again, the glaciers can grow, and it would plow over all those. And it would make a new one somewhere else. So this is literally just a, a snapshot. I'm uh, sorry, just thank you. Just set on the chair there. Oh, well, thank you very much. All right, this is a snapshot in time. Right now, is the glacier receding or moving forward, though? Right now, as far as we can tell, is are these glaciers receding or moving forward? Receding. Okay, but again, that could change tomorrow. So here's my super fancy diagrams. All right, remember our vocabulary words. We had lateral moraine, we had medial moraine, we had <coughs> end moraine, we had recessional moraine, we had terminal moraine. Again, this is like, what, nine, I don't know how many is here, nine more points on the test? All right, so what is Z? Lateral. Lateral, good. W? They're in the middle, so yeah, medial moraine. All right, looking at T, we only have one at the end, so that must be <coughs> called an end moraine. All right. If we look at Glacier A, you got two moraines. So the one furthest out, S, is called, we're forgetting the words, terminal. terminal. X is recessional. And that scatter shot in the middle there, U, is the ground moraine. I could ask the same question on this diagram. Glacier A is... Growing or receding? Receding because we have an end moraine. Glacier B, however, we don't know. At the moment, it's leaving a moraine, but we don't know if it's growing or not growing. Okay. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. At the very least, seven questions here, guys. Uh, again, plus I could ask you about the growing or receding up to eight. All right, got diagrams on this test. You guys haven't had a whole lot of diagrams. Um, please take some time and, and remember these when it comes time to study. Hmm? Crooked. Well, I drew them that way on purpose. Okay, real pictures again. Uh, we are looking out uh, in a, a wastage area here in front of a glacier. Uh, and you can't really tell any of these moraines they want you to see. I've got a much better picture of a moraine here in a moment. Um, but it gives you an idea of the wasteland that is in front of these guys. So in this picture, um, on the right side of the great glacier. Um, right here. All right, this is a good example of a lateral moraine. All right, it just kind of grows on the side there as this glacier is melting out. Um, this says it's a receding glacier. I'm going to show you another picture here in a minute and a really uh, high tech animation as we flip back and forth between the two. All right, the, the moraine becomes much more obvious uh, as this glacier retracts. And this is one of those things you, you hear it over and over again. Uh, we went back 30 years later, took another picture from the exact same spot, blah, 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 something like that. 
All right, so again, we move back and forth. That to that, that to that. You see what's only a wee bit of a dark spot here has grown into a full-blown hole by the time we go here. Sadly, I don't remember how much time is in between these, but... Got 11 minutes, thank you. So I told you I had a much better picture of moraines. It's actually this one, all right? Um, you see that U-shaped valley in the uh, background there? And as we come forward into the foreground, um, you see how we've, we've built up these ridges on either side. There is a difference there, okay, in, in what the valley's carved out. You see, really that looks like a great picture of a cirque uh, in the background there. Um, but uh, you've got these nice ridges on either side. Uh, down at the bottom here, uh, even though it does seem like it snakes around to the side, they're calling that an end moraine. So we'll believe them. Uh, it's quite possible that just a, you know, a big chunk of ice broke through on that one side there and burst through the moraine. Um, who knows, you know, what happened. But, uh, but so, um, we've got end moraines down at the bottom. All right. Uh, we talked about glacial sediments a couple minutes ago, and we told you that moraines are piles of it, ridges of it. Um, we've got a word, another vocabulary word here. I don't use it too often myself, but it will show up in the text, so I wanted to discuss it. Um, for uh, called till, all right. And again, it's just this these these unsorted piles of, of debris uh, that the glaciers leave behind. They make a point about it being unsorted. Um, because when we see sorting, that tells us that some factor was at work. Usually with a glacier, we're looking at running water, okay? And streams sort things out, they do. Um, wind can sort as well. Uh, wind can only blow certain size sediment, obviously. Uh, so it tends to remove the finer sediments and leave bigger stuff behind. But rivers, flowing water, can move, you know, just about any size, as long as it has the, uh, the energy and the capacity for it. But, uh, so they, they care. In, in our perspective, it's not so horribly important. Uh, erratic, we used that term earlier. That's those giant boulders that are left behind. Again, we're in the context of deposits now, which is where uh, we live. All right, so these are large boulders deposited by glaciers. They were previously plucked. That plucked is actually a scientific word here. Um, that is what they call it when the glacier picks up a big old hunk of something. It is plucking. Plucking. So again, we're in front of the glacier, and um, we see that these uh, streams have basically overrun the moraines. Uh, this serves a couple purposes to show you that that, of course, can happen, but also reinforcing the idea of end moraine, recessional moraine, uh, even though they should call that a terminal moraine, huh? Um, terminal moraine, recessional moraine, and some ground moraine in there. Drumlins and eskers, all right? Um, that, again, is just vocabulary that they love to throw at you in the textbooks. Uh, these are reworked uh, moraine piles. Drumlins are cool because, and you'll see this on a slide or two, because uh, you could kind of tell the direction the glacier was moving because of it. Um, if you don't have any other evidence around, they point in a certain direction. Eskers look like snakes, and that's why everybody likes those. Um, basically, you get it from the, a deposit left in an old stream bed. All right, stream beds tend to wiggle around a little bit, and so that's these mimic that. And again, you could tell that there was a... A lot of people's job is to go through and reconstruct these things, believe it or not. Um, so that's, that's what's going on there. Like I said, they make a big to-do about drumlins. We're going to watch a uh, video from a teacher who was up at Oswego. Um, it's PBS. I apologize for PBS. But it was, uh, I mean, it's a great channel. Don't get me wrong, but it's, you know, PBS is. Not PBS kids. No, no, we're a girl. We'll not be discussing this one with us. But um, 
but it is uh, PBSE, but it's a really good show, and it's it's local, and it's about the glacier's effects uh, uh, all around here, stuff you've probably gone to visit in many cases. Um, if you've been to uh, Moss Island, a lot of kids like to go hiking there. Uh, that shows up. It talks about the drumlins um, on 81. It talks about a whole bunch of things, again, and how you guys are glacial terrain, and we'll probably watch that next class. Um so a drumlin is formed, again, when a, a glacier plows over an old moraine, and it makes uh, elongated hills, drumlin, drumstick. It's supposed to look like a, a chicken leg, okay? Wing. Wait, it's not really a wing. It's the drumstick part. Um, uh, but so the gentle downside slope is oriented in the flow direction, and the steep slope is oriented in the upstream. Let's, let's actually look at a picture here. It's a little easier to see that way. Um, so the narrow part, pointy part, kind of actually points in the direction of, of the flow. And that's helpful for folks who are trying to reconstruct such things. And you've got fields of these. They just like look like rolling hills when you're driving down the road. 81, again, 81 south. They just look like rolling hills, but they are, they go in, they test the sediment so they know, you know, what they're made out of and so on and so forth. And again, flying over in an airplane, if you've flown, uh, I don't know, south out of Syracuse. I've flown in front of you there. Nice, nice. <laughs> if you went south out of Syracuse, you might have seen these. I've been to Syracuse Airport, actually. So, um, again, from 81 ground level, they just look like rolling hills off to either side. You have to get this, this uh, alpine geology, they call it, or getting a bird's eye view. And a lot of times you can climb up to the highest point and just look around. Or nowadays, airplanes are great for that. Uh, yeah, they probably are. I didn't even really ever pay attention to that. Yeah, depending on what the con oh, con here it is, contour interval is 25 feet. So yeah, they're all around you know 620, 675. Some are a little higher, some are a little lower, but they're all about the same height. Yeah, keen eye, good job. Eskers we talked about. Um, they form underneath the glaciers, kind of uh, mimicking the deposits of a stream bed. Yeah, yeah. All right, and we're gonna we're, we're overloading you guys with vocabulary, uh, so we will pause here for the day. Uh, I've been talking to you for over an hour already. <laughs>